Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's New York Spotter, New York Spotted Lanternfly update. My name is Jen Cooper, and I'm the membership and events manager at the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. And I'd like to give a warm welcome to Chris Loeb, who is from the New York State Department of Ag and Markets. Chris has served as the director of the Division of Plant Industry with Nye's Dam since 2014. Prior to his current role, he worked for Cornell Cooperative Extension for over 20 years. We're truly excited to be welcoming Chris today, and we encourage you to ask questions through the Q&A feature at the, top, at the bottom of your screen and engage with each other in conversation through the chat feature on the right-hand sidebar of your screen. And with that, Chris, thank you again for being with us all today. I'll hand it over to you. Okay, super. So thank you very much for, uh, for uh, hosting me today. And I appreciate uh, everybody who, who has joined us. And, uh, you know, and in particular, appreciate everybody that has joined us from the uh, perspective that uh, I do understand that this is harvest season for you. Um, I thought it was important to get some information out there uh, to uh, the wine and grape industry in New York. We've had uh, a number of years ago, one of my staff people, I believe, gave a report to the board of directors. Uh, we've engaged with some members over the last couple of years and had them participate in a couple of uh, multi-state uh, events that we did. But, um, you know, this is a little bit more boots on the ground update. Some things have changed here in the past year or so uh, with Spotted Lanternfly. And again, you know, given that it's harvest season and fall when a lot of people are uh, moving around the state and potentially, uh, you know, coming to your operations uh, to try to enjoy uh, the products that you produce, um, it's important for us to be a little bit aware of, of uh, where Spotted Lantern Fly is, as well as what the state, uh, federal, local response is. And uh, um, let me advance the slide. There we go. So really, we sort of have had a, had a several pronged approach with Spotted Lantern Fly uh, in New York not unlike our responses uh, in uh, a lot of other uh, pest programs that we've done over the years. Um, but in particular, uh, this particular program, we've done a lot of education and outreach. Um, and just a little background uh, for those of you who, who aren't aware, um, Spotted Lanternfly was initially introduced into North America um, somewhere uh, before 2014. And in 2014, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and uh, you know, through a report from somebody on the Pennsylvania Game Commission confirmed spotted lanternfly uh, in Pennsylvania. And from there, um, it's kind of spread out into a number of different states. It's always really important on these, uh, on these calls or these webinars um, to recognize the really, really uh, excellent response that there has been in Pennsylvania. Um, when we look a little bit about how things have, have progressed and how things have moved, we actually expected that we would see spotted lantern fly in the, out in the uh, environment in New York um, a lot sooner than we actually did. And I think some of, some of our success there is, is due to the work that Pennsylvania and the USDA did, also um, due to some of our outreach and education, as well as some of our regulatory approaches. So getting a little bit back uh, on point here, so we do have this multi-pronged approach with our, with our uh, program to do education and outreach, and we've had a number of players in education and outreach, including our own staff, staff at DEC, uh, and a really uh, great partnership with, uh, with Cornell and with the Cornell IPM program. Um, uh, originally, uh, Tim Weigel from uh, IPM was, was working with us prior to his retirement. Uh, when Tim uh, retired, Brian Eschenauer um, sort of picked up the ball on uh, Spotted Lanternfly outreach and has been really, really helpful. Um, survey is uh, pretty much exactly what you, what you would think it is. Survey is sort of our early warning system of going out there 
And uh, first off, doing early detection survey and monitoring. And we started that probably in 2015. Um, and the way we sort of started that is, is it was hand in hand with education and outreach. And so as we got reports of interceptions or dead spotted lanternfly, uh, we began to identify pathways by which spotted lanternfly could get into the state and um, began to survey around those, those areas that looked like they were high risk. We also had a lot of risk analysis, which I'll share a little bit more uh, with you uh, later. The regulatory side of things, uh, we've had an exterior quarantine for a number of years, and basically that put some permitting requirements on uh, goods coming in from states uh, where spotted lanternfly had been, um, had been confirmed. And again, we had really excellent cooperation in particular with the state of Pennsylvania on this. And one of the things that we did uh, as a regulatory action in 2017, 2018, and 2019 was to uh, monitor uh, truck traffic and do inspections in conjunction with the uh, New York State Police uh, Heavy Vehicle Inspection Unit. So when they were out doing their safety uh, inspections, log inspections, what have you, uh, in selected areas of the state, we would have our staff there as well. And once the DOT and state police were done with their safety inspections, depending upon um, the commodity uh, in the motor vehicle and the uh, or point of origin and the uh, destination point uh, for the vehicle, we would uh, then do an inspection and uh, look for spotted lanternfly. And the reason the truck inspection piece was important is that spotted lanternfly, um, although it is a winged insect, it does not fly long distances. It's not a particularly good flyer, but it's a very good hitchhiker and it can move in the adult stage as well as in the egg stage. And as you see a little bit later in my presentation, I'll show you some of the maps and of where we have found spotted lanternfly in New York. And you will see that in many instances, it's uh, associated with um, transportation corridors, parking areas, uh, things of that nature. And then the final um, you know, part of the program is, is the treatment side of things. And um, you know, treatment is, is something uh, that we had done in our Asian longhorn beetle program back probably in the late 90s and the early 2000s in New York City. And along the way in that program with some of the changes in, in pesticide laws and some of the restrictions on some of the products that we were using uh, for treatment, uh, we stepped away from that. Um, right now with spotted lanternfly, we're going through the state environmental quality review process, um, trying to evaluate uh, and come up with a declaration um, as far as what environmental impacts uh, uh, spotted lanternfly treatments may or may not have and um, go through that process so that we are ready to do treatments. Um, anticipate uh, you know, that, that treatments, we've done a couple of um, very limited treatments with some of our partner agencies uh, in the past couple of months. Uh, high risk areas, uh, also areas that we consider to be outliers. And again, when I get into the maps a little bit, I'll be able to uh, share a little bit more detail on that. Um, we've really taken a very different approach on this particular program than what we've done in the past. Um, in the past, you know, our main partners have tended to be um, our agency, uh, USDA APHIS PPQ, and to a lesser extent, DEC, depending upon uh, you know, what, the, what the pest of concern is. In this case, we've, we've opened this up to be much more uh, broad and engaged a lot of different agencies. Back in 2016, <clears throat> excuse me, back in 2016, we put in place an incident command system or a, multi, a um, unified command uh, with a number of agencies involved and in, including USDA, Ag and Markets, uh, New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation, um, 
and several others. And you know, we went into that incident command structure, unified command back in 2016, because we, we frankly thought that 2016 was gonna be the year where we were gonna see this uh, established in the environment in, in New York State. And that actually uh, didn't happen until 2020. Um, if anybody's in, uh, familiar with incident command and unified command, it's very resource intensive. Uh, a lot of people playing very specific roles. Um, and so uh, probably in 2018, we, we took that incident command structure down and we, we sort of transitioned this to more of a program format. But one of the things that we kept from the incident command was the uh, participation by multi-agencies or multiple agencies. And we've actually built upon that uh, to include uh, federal, state, and local agencies who meet uh, a couple times a month uh, via uh, Microsoft Teams or WebEx to talk about what they're doing related to spotted lanternfly. And just for example for you, the uh, types of agencies, we have New York City DEP, New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, New York State and New York City Department of Transportation, um, New York State, New York City Parks, um, all of those groups working together and keeping one another informed about uh, what they're doing on Spotted Lanternfly, uh, all those agencies that I, that I listed off, and that is not the complete list, all have worked on survey. Uh, all of them have uh, deployed traps and service traps and reported data into us. And it's really been, I think, a very innovative approach. And the reason we, we kept that multi-agency coordination is because from the start, you know, watching what was going on in Pennsylvania and then New Jersey and then some of the other states that have, that have dealt with spotted lanternfly, um, we knew that this was, this was something uh, that if we were gonna have an impact, that we were gonna need a lot, of, uh, a lot of faces at the table, a lot of people working together. And so the idea behind this is that, you know, New York State uh, DOT uh, perhaps can do some treatments and, uh, and such along their rights of way or in their rest areas or do outreach through their rest areas. And it just is really an example of the multiplier effect and trying to get uh, folks out there. Uh, from this incident command and multi-agency group, we also formed a treatment subgroup and, um, you know, those of you that are involved in production uh, and who do treatments on your farms and, and use uh, pesticides and herbicides, you know that's highly regulated. We feel at the state that we need to be um, uh, actually more compliant than anybody else. We, you know, we uh, have a real responsibility uh, to follow the rules and make sure that we're following all of the rules to the T. And so we have all of these uh, federal, state, and local agencies around the table to talk about treatment, how we do it efficiently, how we do it safely, how we do it um, um, according to the rules. Uh, a couple of specific things on education and outreach here for you. So, you know, we also, as I said before, we're looking at, at what goes on in states who are a little bit further advanced in their programs. And one of the things that we, we were told early on from the state of Pennsylvania is, is that, hey, you put a phone number out there for reporting on this and, and you want the public to report this to you because the trap that we have um, uh, for spotted lanternfly actually uh, does not have a lure associated with it. So it's not what I would call a particularly effective uh, trap in particular when populations are low. So you really need people to be aware and you need them to, to uh, reach out to you and tell you where they've seen this. Pennsylvania, I think in the first year they had a 800 number, they had something along the lines of 40,000 calls. They could not respond to all of them. Um, what we've done is we have a, a designated reporting tool um, that sends an email to several of us, and then we can sort the emails. You know, we do get emails from other states, um, 
And interestingly enough, I'm getting a lot of uh, I'm getting a lot of voicemails forwarded to me from the state of Indiana because they do have a phone number, and whoever set their uh, website up is really good with the uh, analytics because uh, even if you're standing in Staten Island, New York, looking at spotted lanternfly, and you Google where to report it, it sends you to Indiana. Um, we've used QR codes. Also a lot of citizen science engagement through the IMAP invasives and the iNaturalist program. So we have technical interfaces with those so that we uh, have those reports of spotted lanternfly in New York flagged for us. And then we get an email about them. And then we can sort through them and say, okay, these ones are places we, we know we have spotted lanternfly. Uh, and these ones over here are, are, uh, are new locations that we need to get somebody out and take a look at them. Also with education and outreach, I wanted to make sure that I shared with this group that we have a lot of um, you know, printed materials from fact sheets uh, to little egg scraper cards um, to actually some, some coasters that are uh, actually um, um, targeted outreach materials that we have on hand for the uh, craft beverage industry. And um, you know you can request that type of material from us if you, it's something that you want to share with your customers. And so um, I'll make sure that the folks at the foundation uh, know who to get in touch with if if there's any of that material that you wanted to request for your own use. So on survey, uh, we have a risk modeling map, uh, which is something that we're updating. Uh, on a regular basis. Initially, the risk modeling map really just took into account population centers and transit corridors. Uh, uh, and when I say transit corridors, um, you know, uh, truck and private passenger car, highway type stuff. Uh, we, we've learned in the last couple of years that spotted lanternfly seems to be moving really nicely and spreading uh, by using uh, rail rail corridors and rail cars. Um, and so um, that's been really a challenge working with the, the rail industry because they are, they're highly regulated from the safety aspect, but they're also uh, pretty parochial. And um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of hurdles to cross before you get access and gain access to uh, a railroad right away or railroad equipment to do survey inspection or treatment. Um, we're using standard one square kilometer grids for our survey grid, and you'll see the maps we'll, that I'll show you here in the next couple of slides. Um, and we're using a, a number of different methods for uh, survey. Visual ground survey is uh, the main part. Uh, we've also used uh, survey from, from boats, the picture there that you see on your screen. That's uh, one of our inspectors from Western New York. And he's surveying, I think that was, I, I can't remember, that was one of the Finger Lakes uh, in 2015. We had uh, one of our original reports that we had in the state, property owner uh, on the lake about this time of the year sent us a picture of a live spot at Landronfly, did not collect that specimen. Um, Landowner had a connection to the quarantined area in Pennsylvania, and we went out and uh, responded. We've also used uh, UAVs or drones for survey. In particular, we've used those associated with some of our truck inspections. Um, we can't have our inspectors go up on the uh, top of a, of a tractor trailer um, because of the is safety issues with ladders and such, but um, we have had DEC come out with their uh, with their drones uh, and actually the the imaging from those uh, above a truck are pretty good and you can you can spot a spotted lanternfly adult or egg mass um, through that means. Um, sort of a new technique that we're working on here is environmental DNA survey and eDNA is a method. Uh, that's been used a lot for uh, many aquatic invasive species. It's really sort of uh, fairly um, new technology where you're, you're looking for trace DNA out in the environment that, that indicates that, that the, uh, the survey target has been there. And so we've had a nice project 
um, with uh, New York State uh, DOT, uh, Federal Highway Administration, and Rutgers University to look at how eDNA uh, could be used uh, for spotted lanternfly for early warning. And we think it shows some promise. The other thing that has been used is a canine survey. And so there are two uh, canine detector dogs in New York State that have been trained on spotted lanternfly. Uh, those two dogs belong to the uh, New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, uh, which is the sponsor organization for the Lower Hudson Valley uh, a Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management or PRISM. And so the PRISM groups, there are I think eight or nine of them around the state. They're funded through DEC, through the Invasive Species Program and the Environmental Protection Fund. And um, those groups have been really super about helping us with survey, um, also uh, with treatments as well. And in particular, that Lower Hudson PRISM uh, has been extremely helpful to us and very responsive uh, to our needs. So we've been very blessed with a great relationship there. And you know, the ability to utilize some of these organizations that I've mentioned really comes from all of the work that's been done around uh, Part 575, which is the prohibited and regulated invasive species law. And um, you know, the work that the state agencies who are involved in the Invasive Species Council and the uh, um, state agencies, as well as the um, not-for-profit advisors, advisory groups who um, are on the Invasive Species Advisory Committee. And so um, those programs are really paying off and the relationships that have been built there have been very powerful. So I'll start to go through a few of the locations where we've we found spotted lanternfly in New York. Um, and when I say found spotted lanternfly in New York, these are the places where we've seen multiple life stages as we've been surveying and where we feel that there is a population that has been established. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, we had a number of interceptions through the last six or seven years. Many of them were dead spotted lanternfly. Uh, a few were live spotted lanternfly along the way. Um, but these locations that I'm sharing with you today are the places where our survey has indicated uh, multiple life stages. And these are places that as we get a little bit further out and complete the seeker process uh, that, that uh, will be prioritized for uh, treatment. And so Orangeburg, uh, Orangeburg area here, uh, Rockland County, I believe, a little bit outside uh, New York City. Um, the area here, uh, this is a rail trail area. Um, and we found spotted lanternfly uh, there probably late last fall. And so you've got a rail trail here. You see you have a college campus. Um, there are a number of uh, businesses in the area, a car dealership, a home improvement store, a number of different places. And um, this is one of the areas where the Lower Hudson Mohawk Prism has been extremely helpful, uh, working with the Cooperative Extension uh, in the county as well. Uh, they did go in and along the rail trail, a lot of very heavy vegetation, uh, a very heavy um, uh, population of, of Alanthus, which is an important host for spotted lanternfly. And um, the PRISM uh, actually was able to do a number of treatments here uh, earlier in the summer and make a, make a dent on the population and really allow us to, to kind of, um, I don't want to use the word experiment because I'm not sure that's a great great word to use, but it, it allowed us to implement some control measures and, and see what worked well, what didn't work well. So Orangeburg, uh, Orangeburg, uh, fairly significant population there, but we do think we've made a dent in it. And so one of the things that we'll be looking at going into the winter months is there is an oviside that can be used for spotted lanternfly. It's a product called uh, golden oil. It's a soybean oil product and basically it, it smothers the eggs and has a pretty good uh, efficacy rate. 
Uh, Ithaca, New York. This is one that was discovered um, late last uh, summer, early fall. Um, again, a location uh, on the edge of the uh, Cornell campus. Um, I believe just a couple of adults found there last year. We did go in in the winter. We did a pretty significant egg survey. Uh, we were not at the point uh, with a, the seeker process um, or the uh, registration labeling process to be able to do oviside treatments at that point in time. And what we did uh, probably in January or February was worked with three property owners um, where uh, we had discovered eggs and worked with them uh, as well as the city of Ithaca and one of the local utility companies out there to actually do some tree removal. Um, trees that had eggs on them, we removed them, we chipped them because we had some uh, guidance from, uh, from USDA that the chipping process would, would mitigate the risk from the, uh, the eggs. And we think we reduced the, the uh, egg population significantly. We do have a few adults that we have seen in the Ithaca area here um, late this summer. We're monitoring that and in the process of, of trying to get a treatment contractor in there to try to um, uh, mitigate that population quickly because this, this one is what we describe as an outlier very concerned about it from the standpoint of proximity to vineyards and orchards, and also concerned about it with proximity to uh, several college campuses and um, you know the many people who come in and out of those areas uh, on a daily basis. Uh, Slotesburg, the Slotesburg rest area, that's the first rest area on uh, Interstate 87 coming up out of uh, New York City backs up to parts of Harriman State Park, um, discovered uh, spotted lanternfly there uh, in the fall, early winter. Um, that survey I think was done by New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. And so we've been working with the Thruway Authority and parks um, to get some treatments out in that area because again, um, if we allow that to establish and grow there, if you've ever been to that rest area, I believe it's the one with the parking garage and it's a very, very busy rest area um, and a lot of different directions that people go from there. And so we wanna, we wanna try to keep that one under control and get that one under control quickly. So we're hoping to have some treatments done um, this fall. Uh, this one right here, uh, Westchester in the Connecticut state line, this one was a little bit cryptic. And I think that's a really important and good word for describing spotted lanternfly is, is that it is very cryptic. You see it in an area and then you might not see it in contiguous areas. So uh, federal staff and some staff with uh, the Connecticut, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station had actually um, seen adult spotted lanternfly on the Connecticut side of the state line. Um, this was last year, I believe. We were in this uh, airport area here uh, all through the winter months surveying, looking for eggs through the spring and summer, looking for adults. And I think it just is in the last couple of weeks when we've seen adults in this area. Again, so this one, this one is, uh, is a challenge for us because our authority stops at the, uh, at the New York State line. Um, and so this is an area where our, where our colleagues from USDA, uh, P APHIS PPQ, uh, can be very, very helpful because they can work on both sides of the state line. So this is a, an area that is likely uh, that USDA will take the lead on as far as doing treatments and um, you know, probably be a little bit more efficient because they can, they can cross the state line there. Uh, Port Jervis. So Port Jervis, uh, again, this is along uh, the uh, I-84 corridor. This was one of the areas that uh, when we ran our risk model back in 2015, 2016, um, certainly lit up as an area where we uh, 
we thought survey was high priority. We were in there uh, probably in 2016, 2017, uh, and have been increasing survey there, um, and have had a couple of positive hits on our traps in that area. And this is another area where uh, the lower Hudson prism has been able to go in and do some treatments and in, in an effort to try to uh, slow this down there. And again, you know, concerned about the fact of all of the people who drive through or travel through that area um, and potentially go into, um, you know, areas where there's high value ag crops being grown. So uh, this one, Conklin, this is one of our more recent finds. Actually, I think this one uh, popped up in the last week or so. Uh, Conklin, if you don't know, I believe it's a little bit southeast of Binghamton. And uh, again, this is, this is uh, associated, it's sort of an industrial area. There's a number of different plants in the area. Uh, we've had traps around here for a while and uh, did pick up a positive. And as we've gone in here and done a little bit more intensive survey, we've picked up some more. Um, we're gonna be going into this area in the next couple of weeks with uh, you know, 12, 15 inspectors uh, and spend a week in there and really uh, work to delimit this. The other thing that we're doing in, uh, as we're doing survey, and it's important, this is you know, an integrated approach. We're also doing uh, in particular in areas where we think it will be a high priority for treatment, we're also doing property assessments. And what a property assessment is, is, is looking at the properties where we're finding spotted lanternfly, looking at um, how much tree of heaven there is, how big the tree of heaven is, um, because the uh, management program or treatment program at this point really will uh, probably focus on uh, treating the tree of heaven, and I'll have a treatment slide here a little bit later, and uh, trying to, to, uh, to kill spotted lanternfly basically uh, when they feed on tree of heaven towards the end of the summer. Uh, I, leave, I, leave the, I leave the biggest piece for last here. This is uh, Staten Island and, and uh, uh, Brooklyn. And again, uh, Staten Island was the first place we confirmed this in New York. Uh, just about a little more than a year ago, probably was uh, middle of August of, of 2020. Um, this, was, uh, this was survey done by our friends at the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. Um, my geography may be a little bit off here, but down here on this part of Staten Island, there is a state park called Clay Pit Ponds State Park, and that's where park staff first reported this. And from there, we had DEC, USDA, and park staff basically survey every square kilometer uh, grid on Staten Island between probably, probably the 15th of August and the end of the federal fiscal year, which is September 30th. Um, we did a quick survey of all of those grids, and we were able to find spotted lanternfly in just about every grid on Staten Island. And so you have a couple things going on there in Staten Island. Number one, you have uh, the port over here, uh, the Elizabeth Marine Terminal. Um, you've got areas over here in New Jersey that have been known positive for a period of time. Um, and then, uh, you know, the feeling is, is that between the, the auto and rail traffic and truck traffic, as well as perhaps even uh, being carried by the wind, they came over here into Staten Island and established. And from there, um, you know, into Brooklyn, they're starting to see some spotted lantern fly around uh, JFK Airport in Queens now. And so obviously very concerned about this moving east. We've had a couple of reports in Nassau County this fall, uh, which we have responded to. And, um, you know, we've had basically reports come in where somebody has taken a picture. It's geotagged as, as Nassau County. We go out and we look. Uh, we don't necessarily see anything when we're out there. Um, 
or if we do see, see something, very, very small numbers. So we're concerned about this moving uh, further east and in particular concerned about, um, you know, about the vineyards out on Long Island. But also, you know, if, if you are an ag person out on Long Island, whether you're grapes or uh, nursery stock or what have you, uh, vegetables, you know, folks are coming out from the city at this time of the year to, to uh, either visit the winery or, or pick up their, their pumpkins and their mums and such. And so really doing a lot of outreach um, in the New York City area about inspect your vehicle, make sure you don't have adult spotted lantern fly in the vehicle. And also to, uh, if you're an individual who's coming out of the city to a uh, vacation home, be sure you're not bringing egg masses. Uh, egg masses are just beginning to be reported out of some of the states like Virginia and uh, Delaware. And so it won't be too long before we'll see egg masses here in New York. Just a list here, I've already kind of gone through this of who's surveying. Um, again, um, a lot of great reports from the general public. Uh, we continue to encourage reports from the general public, especially, um, you know, uh, Suffolk County, Nassau County, and the upstate counties. Um, we have a lot of reports out of New York City. Uh, one of the things which I mentioned earlier, very challenging, even though we're doing this uh, electronically and with a lot of automation, is we want to we we don't want to miss something. Uh, from an outlier area because we have a lot of reports coming in, in from the city. Um, and not to say we're not concerned about the city, we are, but we're just, we're trying to uh, prioritize our resources and be sure that we don't miss something. Uh, we talked a little bit about regulatory here already. Um, again, uh, we've been pretty innovative here. We actually do have some funding from USDA um, to put in place a rail inspection program. Um, pretty innovative that railroads are, are uh, you know, a conveyance that certainly can move agricultural pests. We have not had a real presence uh, on the, uh, with the railroads for a number of years, but there's definitely a renewed interest in, in railroads. And so our partners at the New York State Department of Transportation Rail Inspection Unit have been very helpful with this. Uh, here's the reporting uh, information. There's our website. There's also a dedicated email. Um, we'll make sure that the presentation gets shared with the staff at the foundation so that they have those emails. Um, you know, very important when you, if you make a report, we want a specific location. We like to see photographs and if possible, if you can capture one for identification in particular, if you're in an outlying area that we haven't talked about today. A um, little bit on treatment here. We've been working for a couple of years actually with uh, the IPM program and Cooperative Extension and Cornell on getting uh, the proper registrations for products uh, for spotted lanternfly control. Uh, here's a link uh, where you can find the control measures. And when you get to that uh, web page. You'll see the link over here on the left, uh, insecticides for use on spotted lanternfly. And so there's a pretty significant or extensive list there uh, based on commodity, based on location that you can take a look at. And uh, you know, IPM, the IPM specialists and the extension people are there to, you know, to help you and talk you through this type of thing as well. Just a little bit really quickly on our treatment approach. Um, Typically what we're doing is we survey about a half mile beyond the last known positive um, and get to a place that it's clean. And then we're gonna treat all of the Alanthus in that core infested area, uh, plus a quarter mile ring around the infested area. So with the Alanthus treatment, it's uh, Alanthus that are above six inches uh, diameter and breast height would be treated with Dinotefuran, uh, which is a systemic material and then the small, Alanthus uh, are either removed or killed with a hack and squirt, which is basically, you know, 
uh, wounding them or cutting them down and then treating and then treating the stump. So a little bit on our next steps, we're working on, uh, you know, our, our work plan for 2022, uh, working with USDA to kind of um, break the state up a little bit geographically for treatment purposes uh, based upon the different agency expertise where we have staff. Um, you know, USDA, I think, probably is going to shake out as, as uh, taking the lead in, in the city. Um, they have a big presence at JFK with a plant inspection station. They do a lot with international air cargo there. And so, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, impacts on New York agriculture, but the other thing that is potentially a concern is that, you know, this gets on a plane and shows up in California. Uh, that's a, a, a live in California. That's kind of a game changer particularly for, for the federal government that's involved, that's responsible for the interstate movement uh, of, of uh, uh, regulated articles. Uh, continue survey around the infested areas to determine the extent of the infestation um, and then development of individual site management plans. We think, you know, we'll probably do a number of public meetings about management plans and, and what we plan on doing. Um, as many of you probably know, when you, when you undertake uh, a management plan that perhaps involves the use of, of treatments, that can be a little bit challenging. Um, although I will say a lot, of the, a lot of the phone calls and things that we're hearing out of New York City um, are that, are that you know, the population is pretty high and it has a pretty high nuisance factor there as well. And so there is some level of, of frustration for, uh, on the part of folks down there um, and uh, perhaps the desire to have this get treated. So uh, here's my contact information. I'm happy to talk with folks further. Um, also, uh, my email there, happy to answer emails. And I think at this point, um, I'll open it up for, uh, for questions. Well, thanks so much, Chris, for being with us today. I don't see any questions that have come in, um, but we'll get everyone the recording as well as the um, uh, Chris's slides here today, and then you'll have all the information that he presented to you. So uh, thank you so much.